My name is Amanda Hamilton Holloway. I'm a PhD student at the University of Queensland and in the Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. I'm here with Professor Janet Wiles from the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering, one of the chief investigators at the Center of Excellence. Thank you, Janet. What is your elevator pitch? In two minutes, what is it that you do? I guess my research these days focuses on social robots and in particular the interaction dynamics between people and robots. So when I'm thinking about people and robots, I'm thinking of people of all ages, including very young children, people of all cognitive abilities. So we work with social technologies, not just social robots, but technologies in general, uh, for people uh, living with dementia. Also different knowledges and cultures. So a lot of technology has been designed um, for urban cultures, and I'm interested in going beyond just the English speaking, typical urban setting to putting social robots into multiple different cultures. And then where my research overlaps with CODAL is particularly in the use of language that we as humans might use with technology. So it's how humans use language with tech, but also how language impacts on our accessibility for technology. So what can technology do with language that say 10, 20 years ago we couldn't do? One of the main goals of the Centre of Excellence has been to bring together researchers from fields that are in some ways quite different. When roboticists, computer scientists and linguists get together, what do you think they can learn from each other? So I think the multidisciplinarity of the Centre is one of its huge strengths and I think there is a lot that we can learn. From the computer science side, when you are designing or developing technologies that will use language, an understanding about the breadth of human language, the formal structures that linguists would study, but also how language is used uh, in the moment, in communication, in conversation, that it's more than just information exchange. All of that is useful to the computer scientist, to the roboticist. Um, and then to the roboticist in, uh, in particular, the full embodiment of language. So language didn't evolve uh, for ethereal beings to swap information. It evolved for fully embodied people to communicate with each other. So I think understanding how people use spatial terms and temporal terms, how that works across different individuals, different families, different age groups, um, all of that is really useful from an engineering perspective. So what I think the computational side can help with the linguist, we bring new computational techniques. So things like um, transcription. Transcription is the gateway to being able to use language with technologies in many cases. But it's very slow, and it's one of the things that you know, we've discovered in the center is like the iceberg that's underneath the water. The research you want to do is the little bit you see at the surface, and then you've got this 80% of your time is spent transcribing. So what technology can bring is ways of accelerating uh, the things that a linguist might do, but then what it can also bring is machine learning. So ways of thinking about doing things that we might never have done before. What has it been like for you coming into this discipline? There's sometimes an assumption that language and the centre of excellence belongs to linguists. And actually, the centre of excellence is much broader than just the linguistic discipline. Language is used right across uh, certainly the humanities, but it's also used right across areas of engineering as well, and health and other disciplines. So when I look back on my uh, path over many years as a computer scientist, uh, we do a lot of different projects. Many of my projects, not all of them, have involved some aspects of language. So coming into a center like this, I'm bringing a past understanding of developing tools, developing models, I did a lot of work in uh, modeling evolution of language in different ways, and then robots and language. I feel like I'm bringing a lot of little pieces of the puzzle, working with people who have an interest in the core phenomena of language, but also many other pieces of the puzzle. As you've seen, linguists often collect huge amounts of data, but many linguists are not data scientists. 
What's one piece of advice that you would give to a new linguist about how to best manage and benefit from their data? So I think managing data is uh, a really interesting and critical problem. And the thing I'd say is look at the linguist you know, the field linguist who has the best data collection and find out what they've done. Because I don't think getting advice from someone outside the field is necessarily going to help you understand how to sort and store your corpus. Um, then if you want to do something like machine learning, then I think it's really good to talk to someone like Dan Vanesh on our advisory board. What do the big tech companies do with their data corpora? How do they structure their data? How do they collect it? What do they do? And so get an understanding of what might be done if you had 500 speakers, 500 sentences, um, standardized data collection, what would you be able to do? So you've got two quite different disciplines, different methodologies. One might be for languages where you've got a lot of speakers, a lot of access, you can just pay to get a lot of data. The other where you have to do field linguistics um, and the methodology of the field linguistics um, is absolutely critical for collecting your data. How did your academic journey begin? Did you know you wanted to work in computer science right from the start of your undergraduate degree? So I started in engineering and uh, I think I was interested and I've always been interested in how computation, this sounds odd, but how computation is embodied in the world. How do you get the logic of the world embedded in physical substrate? Which is kind of an odd question. I don't think I actually crystallized out that that was my question until probably around about third or fourth year. In first year, I loved programming. Uh, I, I loved the idea that you can give a set of instructions and make this device step through them, take some input and spit out some output, and you're completely hands off. And so from a start of what is programming, I guess I got into the logic devices, and eventually in our fourth year, we got to design silicon chips, so little wafers of silicon, and you, you put little bits of metal on them, and then bits of poly, which is a, a resistive material, and by changing the voltages, you can turn these things into logic gates. And then if you put them all together, you can build bigger and bigger circuits, and they can do more and more interesting things. So I guess that's when I got really hooked on how you can make computation happen at that level. Where I went from then into my PhD work was asking, well, if you take this idea that there's something like a logic gate in your brain, how does a neuron compute? So what is it about a neuron that's equivalent to these little bits of metal and poly on silicon? And then how do you put lots of these together and get a whole circuit, so we call it a brain network, and how do those compute? Anyone who has spoken to you for even a short while knows that you have a really broad range of interests. What types of work have you done in fields outside of computer science? So computer scientists tend to be project scientists. We take on a particular area, work in a domain, we have certain methodologies we use. I guess the thing that's run through a lot of my work is computational modeling. For my PhD, I was building models of different theories of how neurons work together to form interesting circuits. Turns out those theories weren't particularly good, so I did my postdoc in psychology because I wanted to learn a lot more about how the brain really computes. So we were building models of memory. And there's a difference between memory and learning. Memory is one shot. You, you can hear a word once and then you can remember it even a year later sometimes. But learning is different because it's slow, it's the categorization, it's the learning to ride a bicycle. Learning uh, is much longer. So I'm interested in how the different neural circuits might support memory in one case, but you change the learning rule or the way the circuit's configured and you'll get something like learning. Change it again, make, you know, adding recurrent connections, which is what Jeff Elman did with his simple recurrent networks, and you might be able to abstract grammatical structure. So in the 
computer science realm, each of these networks is a different part of, an, of a full brain architecture. So I've worked on things like the cognitive architectures, um, the ways they might be used in, uh, in memory, in learning, in robotics. A lot of times you've got multiple different um, effectors, so muscles in essence, and you don't know how to use them effectively. A learning algorithm can sometimes work. So some of the work I've done is going into um, real brain networks and working with people who are building models of particular parts of the brain. One of the really interesting areas of the human brain, deep in the brain, it's an area very important for memory, so one-shot learning, uh, is an area called hippocampus. This is the area where you have new brain cells, even as an adult. Now, new brain cells in the human brain are very rare. So gradually these cells are growing themselves into this circuit that's there. Now, why? One of the things we know as electrical engineers is that if you have a Boeing 747 in flight, you don't want to rewire it while you're flying. And it was always thought that with the human brain, you don't want to rewire in flight. But here you've got a critical region of the brain which is rewiring all the time. And uh, so what the group at the Salk were trying to do is to build a model and very talented um, researcher Brad Imany was building this model and I came in just as a, as a modelling advisor on this, working to try and understand what these new brain cells were doing. So initially everyone thought they were there for novelty. What Brad found is that actually these cells are much more active when they're young and as they get older they get quieter and quieter. And it was a very odd phenomena, but he put it in his model because he was building a bottom-up model that was very high fidelity to how this region of the brain worked. And it just completely destroyed the functionality of the system. Everything we thought had been hypothesized about this region wasn't working when you put in these real neural parameters. And it caused us to completely rethink what the cells were doing. And it turns out what is now thought, and this is more than 10 years later, um, is that what these cells do is they're connected with the timing uh, of memory. So if you remember back to a certain time in your life, a lot of memories will have had similar newborn cells born at that time and they are all recording events at that time. And so you might think back to your 15th birthday and initially you can't remember very much but it kind of wakes up a few neurons and then those wake up a few more memories and that brings back a few more and you'll get this whole flood of um, memories that all relate to that one event. These newborn neurons back when you were 15 were very active in coding everything and as you uh, matured over time they uh, play a much more specific role in those memories. So it, that kind of example is, say, is showing how something that starts out as a modelling idea ends up um, maybe conflicting with the best ideas at the time. You've got to rethink what you're doing. That generates new experimental hypotheses that you can test. You go back into the lab and then uh, various colleagues, other colleagues, Andrew Cheever's lab at UCSD, tested some of these ideas in how rats explore environments over time. So how did you get started in social robotics? So the interesting thing about a lot of the work we've done in cognitive architectures uh, is that the cognitive architecture is a theory of how your perception, your memory, your learning, language um, and action all fit together. And we were building theories of what was happening in hippocampus. Hippocampus is a region in the brain that's used for navigation. So we were building neural models and we wanted to test them. And we built a little robot rat. And the, we put the models into the robot rat and then we ran that around a neuroscience lab. Um, this was my colleague Andrew Chiba's lab in San Diego. Um, and we wanted to test whether our neural algorithms were similar to the kinds of things the rats were doing. We noticed, actually Andrea primarily noticed, that the rats were treating the robot not just as a novel object, they're very curious, they'll investigate novel objects, 
but also maybe treating it not as a rat, they knew it wasn't a rat, but as a social other. They were exhibiting social behaviours towards the robot rather than just cognitive, what you might call cognitive behaviours. And that started a whole area of thinking about robots not just as cognitive architectures embodied in devices, but social devices. So as soon as any large moving object comes into your physical space, it's going to have a different impact on you than just a stationary wall or something else. And if it has its own intentions, it will hook the parts of your brain that seem to be used for social engagement. So we started out with rat-robot interactions. There's some fascinating studies done where Andrea's lab was studying how rats will let other rats out of an enclosure when they're trapped, if they uh, know the rat or if they've, if they've grown up with the rat. What happens when the one that lets them out of the enclosure is a robot? So they start by getting to know the robot, the robot lets them out of the enclosure. What happens when the robot's trapped? Do they care? How do they treat that situation? And what we discovered is they will let their friend robot out um, most of the time. So they seem to treat the robot trapped in the same way that they would treat a rat that was trapped. And that uh, was um, a demonstration of a way in which um, a mammal and a robot, so rats are fascinated by robots as humans are and dogs are and other animals. Um, and we began to look at the social interactions between them. So then when we had an opportunity to work with children and robots, we're looking at what are the, not just what does the robot need to be cognitively, what's its cognitive architecture, but also what's its social interactions. And a lot of the work I've been doing with the Centre of Excellence is around the social dynamic. So when a child is close to the robot or the robot is close to the child, so in the peripersonal space, within touching distance, um, if you spread your arms out in front of you. And then social timing, a lot of our social timing is 200 milliseconds or so in turn taking, up to a second or two. So when a robot interacts with you in real space, in real time, it changes the dynamic from being an object to being some sort of social other. And that's why we call it social robots and not cognitive robotics. Apart from your research, what else inspires you? So the thing that really excites me about the world around me tend to be com how computation is embodied in the world. And I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but it's how computers work at a really fundamental level. And then you link them together in this tiny little circuit when you have a million of them, create these elegant, beautiful, intricate patterns. And then you take something like a brain and you've got something like a single neuron or a single synapse on a neuron. And you put a lot of these together and you get these incredibly powerful systems. And then you get things like people and the social in interactions between people, you scale that up, you get whole societies. So, so one of the fascinating questions I find in this, when you change a tiny part of the system, so maybe one gene, mostly nothing happens, or one word in a, in a, um, a novel, it doesn't change much. But then there are some places where one tiny change ripples through and changes everything. And these are like little levers that can change the world. And I'm really interested by the way an individual person can become a change agent that ripples out through society.